Hey, deserving listeners, we have a very special guest on the podcast today, Paul Gilmartin. He's from the Mental Illness Happy Hour podcast. Uh, I've been listening to his podcast for years. Uh, Back in the day when I think there were probably a handful of podcasts worth listening to in the psychology arena, some would start to say that that's still sort of the case, but uh, I've been listening to Paul for years and years, and I've always wanted to have him on the podcast. So welcome to the podcast, Paul. Well, uh, thanks, Kirk, and I'm super flattered. Uh, you know, anytime somebody who's a mental health professional listens to the podcast and enjoys it, I'm I'm always just uh, just really flattered and honestly um, kind of surprised. I guess maybe that's just my low self esteem, but <laughs> and 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 it it also proves to me that there is a therapist who is really passionate about what they do. The fact that on their off hours, they're listening to more stuff about psychology. I mean, that just uh, amazes me. So thank you. Has any therapist ever said that you're a good therapist? Because I'll say that I'll I'll be, if you haven't heard that, I'll I'll say Uh, you have, I'm a trainer of therapists. I'm an, I've been an educator of therapist supervisor for 20 plus years. And, uh, it's my job to know when people have a good intuition regarding what to say, how to be attuned, when to amplify things, when to slow things down, when to uh, reassure, when to not reassure. Uh, I just think you have an excellent instinct for the you know foundational skills of being a therapist. Well, thank you. That that means a lot to me. That means a lot to me. Do other therapists tell you that? Uh, they, they say, you know, you would make a good therapist. Have you ever considered becoming a therapist? And I always say, you know, I'm comfortable being the cheerleader for you guys. You guys are the football team. I'm the cheerleaders. I'm the cheerleader. I, I'm the one encouraging them to go see you guys in the trenches, doing the real work, having the real responsibility day in and day out to the clients. So, um, yeah. So for my listeners who don't know your podcast very well, how would you describe it to them? Well, the intro to it is uh, Mental Illness Happy Hour, a place for honesty about all the battles in our heads from medically diagnosed conditions, past traumas, and sexual dysfunction to everyday compulsive negative thinking. The show is not meant to be a substitute for professional mental counseling. I'm not a therapist. It's not a doctor's office. It's more like a waiting room that doesn't suck. And then sometimes I'll throw in, I'm, I'm just a jackass that tells dick jokes and used to host a, a TV show where we cook chicken. <laughs> um, yeah. So it, it, that when you say the intro, it, you know, it's, it's like, uh, it's weird to actually talk with you as you're giving that intro because I've heard it, so, <laughs> heard it so many times. Yeah. And, and, and it's just, it's generally me and a guest and the show is half interview with the guest um, or maybe three quarter interview with the guest. And then I read surveys that were submitted anonymously uh, online by listeners. And as you know, having heard the podcast, those can go pretty, pretty deep and pretty dark and pretty profound. And to me, it's a really big part of the show. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I might have been with you from the very beginning. I, I, I might have been listening in the very first year or something. And I, I, I want to hear your origin stories. But from my memory, it was you were going through your own struggles and you were an entertainer and you wanted to start a podcast. And out of kind of like desperation, you just wanted to hear from other people so you could sort of normalize your own struggles. Do I have that right? Yeah, that was part of it. Uh, before then, it, it the survey started before I had epiphanies about my life. So maybe six months a year before, yeah, probably about six months before I really started to dive deeply into the stuff that I've gone through and was going through. Um, I started reading the anonymous surveys that listeners were were filling out. And I imagine that, yeah, that probably also informed what I was doing, but also the work in, uh, in my support groups and interviewing other men who were sexualized by a parent, uh, that, that helped 
open some some doors for me. So it was really kind of a confluence of a bunch of different things. But yeah, that's that's that was something that was really kind of um, surprising to me was how how much support I really embraced from listeners hearing what I was going through. I would get emails from mothers who would say what your mom did was wrong. And uh, let me tell you as a mother, there's no two ways about it. And I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. And, and those meant the world to me because as you know, when somebody's processing something like covert incest or any kind of trauma from a caregiver, there's a part of the brain that really wants to defend that caregiver, that wants to tell ourselves we're making too big of a deal, we're doing it for attention, we should just suck it up and get, get over it. And so I was stuck on that hurdle. And a lot of therapists that I would have on and listeners who would write emails really helped me get through that with more confidence. Have you seen the documentary, Tell Me Who I Am? I, I've been putting off watching it because I've just, um, there's a part of me that doesn't want to deal with the feelings that will come up, but I know, I know I will watch it. It's at some point. Yeah. I think you're smart to make sure that you're ready for it. Uh, I can't imagine the amount of triggering that it would have for people. For, for those who don't know, tell me who I am as a documentary about, um, well, I, I, got, I, I shouldn't spoil it, but, uh, the beginning of it, I can I can tell you because it doesn't spoil anything. There's twins and one of the twins gets into a pretty bad motorcycle accident when he's, when he's around 18 and he can't remember anything in his life except for the fact that he has a twin. So the only person he recognizes when he wakes up is his twin. He doesn't recognize his parents or his girlfriend or his friends or anything. And he has to be, he doesn't know what a bicycle is. He doesn't know what anything is. And, and his twin brother uh, has this opportunity to, uh, tell him a life that is better than the life that he actually had. And so uh, it sort of progresses from there. And it's a fascinating documentary. And, you know, uh, I, I'm, have people recommended it to you, Paul? Oh, yeah. Yeah, many, many yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. So for people who don't know, uh, Mental Illness Happy Hour, the uh, Paul will have famous people, but also have non-famous people. I think uh, that that's one of the great things of, about his podcast is pick, particularly in the beginning. It was, it was mainly from my memory, uh, people who just discovered you and they just wanted to tell their story of struggle. And the, because of Paul's good sort of, uh, casual therapy style that he has, people just open up to him and they'll just, they'll tell him the deepest, you know, shame and fears and, uh, but it just normalizes it so well. I mean, it's just a powerful normalizing podcast. On my podcast, I I strive to normalize uh, as well. But there, as you know, listeners, there's something much more uh, significantly powerful when you hear it from a person who's actually going through it. Uh, people suffering from bipolar, or people suffering from past abuse, or people suffering from addiction just talking about the shame and the the darkness and the isolation and then paul doesn't hold back his own story you know he he's right he doesn't claim to come down on high and help people you know he's he's right there with the people and uh, a lot of you know quote unquote famous people have have discovered the podcast too and have come on and uh, talked about their own struggles in ways that are very humanizing to, to these people. And uh, am I describing that all of this accurately, Paul? Yeah. And I'm, th and I'm thrilled because that was the, the goal when I set out, I didn't uh, ever intend to have listeners as, as guests, but what I wanted to do was to have the very, very first idea I had was to interview creative people and to explore the link between mental illness and creativity. And I quickly realized that that was limiting. And the thing that, a couple of things that broke it open was adding the surveys. And then I was contacted by a woman um, named Nader, Naderay Fanoyan, who is an Iranian immigrant and 
she emailed me and said, if you'd be interested in having me on the podcast, I think my story would be interesting. And oh boy, was it. It was uh, probably twice as long as any episode we'd done until then. And her story was being uh, in Iran as a young woman, just married, pregnant, the Ayatollah takes over. She and her husband are Marxists, and they're targeted for death. And that's where her story begins. We talked for two hours, and we didn't even get to the fact that she's a, night, a nurse in a psychiatric ward today. Wow. That's, that's how much uh, how compelling that story was. And that's when I realized, wow, there is a lot of... There's a gold mine of stories out there if I interview listeners. It's been hit or miss because sometimes you'll have somebody come on who might have an interesting story, but they can't really articulate it in a way that you need it to be when you're asking listeners to listen to somebody for an hour, hour and a half. Um, so occasionally I will record an episode that I that I don't release, which I hate having to do, but... I, I have to try to keep the quality of the podcast consistent. So that that kind of um, broke it open. But the thing that I really, really liked being able to do was to show that somebody who's famous and somebody who isn't have the same feelings inside. The circumstances of their lives may be different, but both people have self-doubt feel like maybe they're a fraud or the bottom's going to drop out at any moment or they hate being around family or they have an addiction or, you know, something. And that, that was something that I really, really wanted to try to get out there because as you know, our celebrity worship culture is so, so toxic and uh, corrosive. Yeah, if it's one through line in everyone that you talk to, it's the deep insecurity that is plaguing all of us on a minute by minute basis <coughs> and, and the shame uh, spirals that we all go on. Uh, it, 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 is that, did you know that you would find that when you started talking with all these people? No, I didn't. Um, but I quickly found out that everybody feels shame, doubt, insecurity, um, and to some degree feels that they're, that they're alone. Um, the people that I've had on that are friends from my support groups uh, generally realize that, that they're not alone in what it is that they're struggling with but they're probably still struggling with what they're struggling with. You know, they, they may not still be stuck in an addiction, but they're still stuck with the, the brain that talks to them every day and tells them the lies that they used to believe. Yeah. I find that to just be a wonderful aspect to your podcast. And it, it just tells us how much we crave or I, how much I crave, I'll just speak for myself, uh, to just, and it, it's sad because we're all struggling, but it's wonderful to hear other people talk about it. And it just, it's so relieving, I guess, to just be like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, I guess everyone's walking around with that voice in their head of just like, yeah. what are you doing? You're a fraud. Right. You, you're, you don't look quite right. People don't like you, you know, uh, it's just this constant thing, you know, and it is increased and exaggerated for people who went through more difficulties than others. But I, I don't know anyone who doesn't have that. And I, you're, yeah. you're, and again, I can say that out loud and I talk about it on the podcast. It's another thing to hear just this every episode, you know, eventually you get there with someone and, and they, uh, you know, just lay it all out there and it, uh, is again reassuring. It's like we're all in this together. We're all, we're all on. You know, we're all in the same suffering foxhole, so to speak. <laughs> I was just going to use that analogy. So we're we are all soldiers in the army for the truth, battling the lies that our that our brains tell us. Um, and 
one of the things I've, I've discovered in all the therapy and support groups I've gone to for years is that there's nobody that I am dishonest with as much as myself. And that's where the bulk of the battle lies for me. You know, getting sober um, has made it so much easier to be honest with people around me. And I, I'd like to, to think that, you know, I'm, I got a good batting average of being honest these days. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to think of the last time I lied to somebody and I can't, I can't even remember it. But I lie to myself every day. I, I'm, I've lied to myself before I get in the shower in the morning. You know, I like told what? myself, told myself that uh, you know I'm doomed because I'm lazy, or uh, you know today is just going to be filled with dread and effort. Yeah, yeah. So I really th- want to thank you for providing that. I, I I don't know what your mission is, but my mission with my podcast is to do my tiny effort to actually try to make the world a better place and whether that's your mission or not, I, I think you're doing that. Is that your mission? Yeah. When I started out, I was still hosting a TV show and doing stand up, and I'd gone off my meds and I was considering suicide. And I was like, holy shit, I got fooled by the depression. I went back on my meds as soon as I realized that's what the problem was. Cause I felt great for about five months after stopping taking the meds and in the past, when I had stopped taking them, usually within a month, um, the depression would come back and I'd go back on them. So I thought I was out of the woods, and I believed that my life really was just going to feel joyless, and, and I would feel doomed. I thought that was reality. And I thought, God, think about the person out there that doesn't even believe mental illness is a real thing. They have so much work ahead of them to try to manage what it is that they're up against. And and I thought support groups are such a powerful experience because somebody is just sharing their story. You're not being lectured to. You're not reading something academic. You're not being talked down to. And I thought there was a gap somewhere between the kind of precious new agey mother earth, you know, um, Sedona kind of, uh, version of, of self-help and the Dr. Phil kind of talking down to somebody. And I thought my support groups are a great template for it. Just two people sharing stories. And I thought that could bring some comfort to people. It's not going to be the solution but it's going to bring them comfort. It's going to be the hand, the, the hand reaching out and holding their hand in the waiting room to see the, the, the doctor or the therapist. And that's what I set out to do. And I never imagined that I would wind up making my living uh, from it. But I, I suppose that's one of the beautiful things about recovery in the universe is if, if we, uh, the, the, um, Author Joseph Campbell said, when we set out, and I'm paraphrasing, to do something altruistic, magical guides show up to assist us. And that's, that's what I found. You know, somebody contacted me and said, hey, uh, do you need help putting a website together? Uh, advertisers contacted me. And all of a sudden, just all the pieces fell into place. And it was an easy decision to say, I don't want to do TV anymore. And it's not like people were knocking my door down to, to do it. It was kind of a mutual, you know, you don't show interest in me and I won't show interest in you uh, thing. And I was so glad that I've never had any doubt about the decision to uh, make this my, my, full-time, my full-time thing. Are you more healthy because of the podcast? I think so. Um, one of the support groups I go to self care is a big topic and I have to really listen to my body and my psyche around doing the podcast because I can sometimes feel overwhelmed and get into uh, 
kind of a place of where my battery gets burned out, you know, reading emails about people's traumas. And um, it's not like I'm getting a flood of them, but I think my, my, my battery can easily kind of uh, get drained just around the subject matter. I get sent books all the time and I read almost none of them. And I warn people when they send me the book, you know, at, I probably won't get to it. At best, I might spot read it. And that's my way of, of taking care of myself because I don't want to dread doing the podcast. Um, but I also feel guilty and I feel lazy um, because I don't do as much as, as some other people would do. And that, again, that's why I take my hat off to people like you who are out there nine to five listening to people's uh, traumas and then listening to a podcast on, on top of it. That's, that's pretty amazing to me. Well, uh, I'll give you some of your own medicine. You're, you're self-shaming a little bit. You're, you're beating up my friend Paul on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'd say something like that if, if I said I something like that. Yeah, I would, I would, but you know, there's that thing where, we wish something was different. And so then we blame ourselves because we can't make that reality appear. Well, what does keep you going, you know, as a fellow podcaster, what, what does wake you up in the morning and want to do this thing? I suppose living a life where I don't feel cornered, um, learning how to advocate for myself. I've, I've created a life where, I'm pretty independent, but I also have a network of, of people that I can go to when I need connection and who can go to me when I need connection. So I have a lot of meaning and purpose and connection in my life, but I still battle depression and, you know, the voice of addiction talking to me and telling me to just isolate and play a video game and, you know, push all the deadlines uh, till the very last minute. Um, but for the most part, when I, when I get going in my day, um, I know the, the track record is that I enjoy my life. It's just that voice is still pretty strong in my brain that tells me the day is going to be an effort. And there are days where it's an effort where I feel numb and the depression is there, especially this time of year when the, when the days are short. Uh, so I try to be good to myself, but there's a part of me that really wishes I was in that place where I'm feeling, uh, vitality and excited about getting in the wood shop and woodworking. Um, so most of the time, um, I, I feel pretty good. Um, but there are stretches where it's just, uh, Meh, you know, it's a perfect word to describe it. Just kind of meh. Yeah. Well, I commend you for, uh, you know, doing what you can and living the struggle and a, a part of what you can do to the world and what you have done is you talk about the meh yeah. and other people are like, oh my God, yes. You know, yeah. no, no one's on Instagram, you know, posting about meh, but... but <laughs> But you're out there talking about. It. You, you mentioned uh, video games. Uh, uh, you, you're a you're a, a a fan of Civilization, like I am. Oh, it's it should come in a crack pipe. That's <laughs> that's how it should be packaged. Just one more turn. Just one more turn. What a perfect perfect slogan for that. <laughs> the number of times I've done just w one more turn, and then the sun is coming up, and I'm like, oh my god. Just a side note, uh, what's your favorite civilization to play? Uh, I like China a lot because they're industrious and uh, I like the fact that they, the uh, special unit that they have, uh, I think it's them, can attack twice. Oh, I, yeah. I, like, I like the Romans because of the roads. Oh, I, you know what? I don't know if I've ever played the Romans, but I should try that one. 
Yeah. I like, your, you know, I like expanding a lot. So you got to have a lot of roads, yeah. you, you know? Yeah. But then you got to be careful that you're, you don't give, make your cities vulnerable because you, you don't have enough units to, to protect them. Yeah. That's always me. But I you like, get good units early on with Rome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite wonder to build? Oh, well, you know, it's early. been a while since I've played the more recent uh, versions, but and I've been playing since Civ One in the mid '90s. Wow! Uh, but like back in the day, the wonders meant a lot more than they do mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Um, and I remember in earlier versions, like Civ Two, Civ Three, the pyramids was just like you got to get the pyramid for the you know granary in every in every yeah. city, right? Yeah. Uh, the Great Wall was a big deal too because of the yes. fences and stuff. Our, my listeners are, you know, like there's 1% where they're just like, oh my God, they're nerding out on civilization. I'm yes. so happy. And the rest of them are just like, what are what? they even talking about? <laughs> like somebody talking about Harry Potter when you've never read the book. <laughs> my, my favorite early wonder um, is the statue of Zeus, because then you get the horsemen that have, uh, I think they're ivory swords or something, uh, but they can move great distances and they kick pretty much any unit's ass around them. And if they get hurt, they can retreat. And so I, I love that one. Do you ever get a sick pleasure out of just nuking an entire civilization? Do you even have to ask that? <laughs> it's just like, you know, Gandhi is, you know, looking <laughs> kind of weak and you just like, well, it's time to go Gandhi. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I've even been so, uh, I don't know if I would use the word bored, but you know, you just want to just find what the limits of the game are. I've nuked my own cities. <laughs> well, so what's that time. tell you about my, my personality? Well, some cities, you know, it, it's so hard to get them to be happy and content. You're just like, ah, oh, it's just a start over, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, um, I, I, again, I, I'm just really curious because I'm, I'm finding myself, I didn't plan on asking you these questions about podcasting, but you know, for me, uh, the podcast is, is fun for me, but it's, you know, it's hard. It's uh, work. It's a job. Yeah. And it's, um, it can be a struggle and sometimes you know, it hurts because people will be offended by something I said. I'm always, I'm not one of those people that's trying to offend in any way, but, right. and I get these emails and the comments or, or just someone just, you know, on YouTube, because we post these on YouTube, but they'll just be mm -hmm. like, you know, you're a terrible therapist or, you know, just stuff like that. And, and it's, it's hard. And, uh, do you ever run into stuff like that? I, cause I'm at, oh, I'm guessing God, yeah. that, Oh, you do. Cause, oh, yeah. cause I feel like who could attack Paul? Like what, what did Paul ever do that would make you want to like, what do, what, what do they even attack you for? Um, sometimes it will, uh, well, the, the few times that I've talked about politics, um, people have attacked me for that. And I thought I handled it very diplomatically and very even handed, but, you know, it was an elephant in the, in the room, the fact that we, we had somebody elected who was bragging about sexually assaulting people. And I wanted to address the fact that a large part of the population are people who have survived being sexually assaulted. And I wanted to talk about the fact that they now felt unsafe um, and that their experience has been completely invalidated. and. Um, and, and I, I prefaced it by saying for a large part of my life, I was a pig. I had no boundaries. You know, I am not looking down on anybody. I, I, I just want to talk about the reality of where we are as a society right now. But of course there were people that didn't hear that and, you know, laid into me. I'm never listening to the podcast again. Um, yeah, uh, you the, some of the iTunes comments, you, this guy's a terrible host. He talks about himself too much. Um, 
Uh, there were people on the occasions that I've talked about spirituality. People uh, got super upset about that. Yeah, there's they're a very small minority. The the majority of the comments and emails I, I get are really beautiful and really supportive, and. I do get constructive criticism from, from people, and I really appreciate those. As hard as they are to read, they've helped me grow as a person and as an interviewer. So um, I'm, I'm grateful for them. But any time I read, I, you know, I've been listening to the podcast. However, you know, my, stomach, my stomach just drops because I just feel like, oh, this is where the world has found out that you're a terrible person and a fraud. And it's all over. Everybody's going to abandon you and you're going to die alone in a ditch, unloved and penniless. <laughs> yeah, yeah you're, you're speaking my language. <laughs> uh, you know, we've both been doing this. I've been doing the podcast for 11 years. You've been doing the podcast for what, like eight or nine years or something? Uh, nine years. I'm in the, the ninth year. It'll be, uh, yeah, nine years. Yeah. And yeah obviously both of us have received a lot of positive feedback both you know you know in directly to our faces and over email and whatnot and yet yeah that however is just, oh yeah it's devastating yeah there there is a phenomenon that a lot of comics experience when they're performing which is we focus on the people who aren't smiling who aren't laughing you know maybe because that they feel like family <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, we want to, you know, we want to turn things around and see if we can get them to enjoy the show. But it can be, it can be that way with the, with the comments. And as you were sharing earlier, there's this, I'm afraid I'm going to say something wrong. I'm going to make a mistake. And then I'm going to get an avalanche of, of emails telling me that they're, they're done listening because I'm an awful person. Do you have any plan? Do you have any plans for the future with the podcast? Uh, or just chugging along? Yeah, just just uh, chugging along. There there are topics that I would like to cover that are a little harder to find guests for. Um, there are certain guests that, if I had more energy or you know assistance that could help me, I would love to reach out and try to try to get those guests. Um, there are always ways that I, I want to expand the, the, the podcast. And of course, like any podcaster, I, I, I want more listeners because I'm, you know, always convinced that it's just going to be left in the dust and then advertisers won't be interested. And I'll be like, well, I, I'm screwed now. I, I have, no way to support myself. So yeah. Who, who would you like to, any names you want to name? Um, yeah, there, there are a uh, John Krakauer would be somebody I, I would, I would love to, to have, um, because I find people who work in arenas where, People, people are doing things that are life or death. There's a personality underneath that that's, that's really compelling to me. And plus, there's also a part of me that enjoys doing things that are, um, you know, for instance, I was into mountain climbing for a while. I mean, you know, clearly nothing as difficult as the subject that, that, that he talks about. But, you know, certainly a, a danger in climbing glaciers and frozen waterfalls and, and, and stuff like that. And there's a, I don't know, there's a, I guess you, you would, you would call it a presence that you, you have to do when there's so much danger. You're so focused. It's, it's like a great movie. Everything else just falls away. And I always wonder what is it that those people are shutting out? Was it a unhappy childhood was it a did dad not hug you <laughs> you know and plus i just love the stories of people surviving brutal conditions um stuff like that um i i suppose uh i'd like to have some high profile people um to get more listeners 
uh, Demi Lovato, somebody that I've, I've, you know, reached out to and um, never heard back from, uh, you know, the people that are long shots to, to get as, as guests. But um, yeah, those are some that I can think of uh, offhand. I've been recording quite a few trans people lately, and I'm really enjoying that because <clears throat> it's, a subject that I think is really important. Um, it, it's such a crucial time for the trans community or anybody who feels marginalized to um, feel safe in the world. You know, as you know, the uh, suicide attempt percentages for people in the trans community is something like forty percent. It's 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 brutal, and there's so many things about the, the trans experience that that I've never heard before. And so I like any time I have a guest where I feel like I'm I'm um, doing some type of service by helping marginalized voices be heard, but probably even more than that, where I'm riveted as an interviewer. Yeah. Is the podcast fun for you in creative? Most of the time it is. There are times when um, I wouldn't say my heart's not in it, but, um, I don't feel the excitement that, that I would like to have, but I don't know any job where it's, you know, you're thrilled to be doing it every day. Um, uh, but when I do sit down in front of the mic and I'm reading things, um, it, you know, or I'm, I'm, I'm talking, it's, um, it, you know, the switch, the switch turns on. It's more kind of the buildup to sitting down and doing the work for that week's episode where I feel, you know, of kind of the dread of responsibility or, um, you know, for instance, editing an episode and I'll just feel restless, like, oh, how much time is left in, in editing this? Oh, so there's another half hour. God, I feel like I'm crawling out of my skin just sitting here editing. How um, much do you edit? I, I, I didn't know. I mean, I know you have to edit because you have like an intro and then the ads and everything, but do you edit the interviews very much? I occasionally do. I'd say most of them don't require any edits, but the fact that I have to listen back to them um, to make sure that there isn't something. Um, and occasionally I'll have somebody help me out and they'll edit an episode for me. And that, that feels really good to, to be able to, to have, do you that. have anyone, do you have anyone else that helps out with the podcast? Like that's, um, somebody uh, helps with the website. Um, there's somebody who helps me with posting the guest blogs and there's somebody who helps me by posting quotes on Instagram. Um, offhand, but all, those but all are, the rest those of are it the, is you. Yeah. Yeah. The rest of it is, is me. And, and, and um, I have an agency that helps book ads uh, for me. I don't know at what point I figured it out, but it was years after I started listening to your podcast that you were Richard Martin on the Adam Carolla show. <laughs> oh, I didn't know you'd heard that. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I've been listening to Adam Carolla since the nineties when he was on Loveline and from the early days when he started the podcast, when the sound quality was really bad. I mean, you know, there are certain things about Adam that are uh, not very pleasant, but you know, mm -hmm. he's, he's a, he's a funny guy. He has a lot of funny people on his, on his podcast. And one of the people that you'd have was for those who don't know, uh, Paul has this alter ego of this right wing congressman that he, he makes fun of, you know, mm -hmm. and he like portrays this, which is really kind of scary. And I guess <laughs> not to get into politics, but we kind of live in a world of Richard Martin right now. We do. It's, it's surpassed how cartoony he was when I, when I started, how ridiculous his opinions and how offensive the things are that he would say. It's like reality has, has caught up. Yeah. Uh, but aside from that uh, uh, horribleness, uh, mm -hmm. for, for years and years, yeah, uh, Adam Carolla would check in with this, with this guy and they would never reveal it was satire they'd never overtly say it was a satire mm -hmm. and and a lot of listeners to the adam carolla show 
thought that you were a legitimate congressman yeah. who, who was right wing and super racist and classist and you know sexist and and uh, had no idea that what you're doing was satire. Yeah, um, I do Jimmy Dore's show sometimes, and in the middle of a show, he will have to say, "Folks, this is satire. Lighten the fuck up." <laughs> <laughs> and like, didn't you get in it, into it sometimes with calling people sometimes? Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But I always took it as a compliment on my writing. If somebody didn't know if it was real or not. Um, yeah. Yeah. It that, was, it was genius. Like that you could, you would riff so fast off of, cause Adam Carolla would just, you know, he'd go back and forth with you and you would just have these lines, like just, it was like you had, there's a corner of your brain that's dedicated to this right wing congressman ready to go at all times. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fun because it's a different muscle than when you're doing straight monology. And, uh, I, I suppose, uh, in a way what, what I do with him is, is I say, what's the opposite of what I think or feel. And, and then I just let that let that go. Or sometimes it's just a dark thought that will pop into my head because everybody has dark thoughts. You know, <laughs> you'll be standing in line for coffee and you see a woman with your, a baby and you think, what would happen if I just took that baby out of her arms and just threw it in the trash can? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that was the sort of stuff that would just have me roll. I mean, it was one of my favorite parts of Adam Carolla show whenever you were on it. And, and it was so weird when I figured out it was the same person yeah. did mental health happen. I was like, what? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. It was right. like those two people are just hold completely different, completely different. And I think about that sometimes when I'm doing it and I'm like, am I being a hypocrite by doing this? But it's, it's satire, but I would edit out anything remotely that Richard Martin would feel or think if a guest said it in the, in the podcast, I, I, I could go further than that. If, if I had any opinion or saying that Richard Martin had my podcast would probably be over in a week, <laughs> but I, I think that's the danger of satire these days is that people don't look for the context of what you're saying it in. And they just look for the buzzwords. And, you know, there's that phrase that, you know, it's called cancel culture. And there's a uh, sometimes a lack of factoring in what is the intent of the person using the, the words or the language that they're using. And, you know, in my case, it's to make fun of the people that are doing that. But some people don't, don't even want to listen to somebody mocking something that's dangerous. Have you been targeted with any of that cancel culture? I have not. I have not. But there's yeah. always a fear, uh, a fear that, yeah. that I will be, and, you know, and advertisers would flee. There's no scenario that the dark part of my brain has not laid out in detail like CGI, you know? Uh, uh, well, if it's any help, uh, your listeners would trample anyone who would – propose to cancel you one two i think podcasts are sort of immune to that because it doesn't you know that are you and I, your podcast my podcast are hours long someone would have to listen to the whole thing just to find a you know a little snippet yeah. to, to to cancel yeah. and if they've gone that far they already kind of know and you know yeah. The people who get canceled are people who tweet just a thing or, yeah. uh, or they have a very short interview on a new show or something. And so I, cause you don't really hear about podcasters being canceled and you, and you got to yeah, figure it, it, we're, we're saying lots of stuff that could be canceled. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, technically we can't be canceled because nobody can stop us from right. posting a podcast. I suppose, uh, you know, iTunes could refuse to, to carry it, but um, nobody can stop you from having your own website and, and putting content on there. Um, right. Yeah, I don't think but, that's ever happened. I don't think iTunes has ever done that to anyone. I, I doubt they have, actually. Maybe they um, have. Yeah, certainly not big ones. They might have done it for small ones that we never heard of. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm glad you haven't been targeted in that way. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, I, 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 and I worry about it too, because as a professional, I'm a therapist and a professor. 
I, I have a, a professional reputation at workplaces that I have to uphold, which right. is, can be pretty scary for me sometimes. And I, and I'll get, you know, real on the podcast and I'll get, uh, so we say relaxed and casual. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I had a student who, uh, came to me not too long ago and she, she was like, yeah, I, I was always really intimidated by you as a professor. And then I listened to your podcast and, and you said bag of dicks and, uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm no longer intimidated by you anymore. <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> I don't that know how to is... feel about that, honestly. I was like, oh, God. Um, well, Paul, it's been great talking with you. I really enjoyed it, Kirk. And uh, kudos on doing your podcast for 11 years, man. You, you are an OG in the podcasting community. Yeah, we just had our thousandth episode recently. It's incredible. That's, that's fantastic, man. Yeah, how many episodes do you have? You've got hundreds and hundreds. 465. Yeah, it's just amazing when you think about yeah. it, you know. Well, yeah, Paul, I think you're doing a wonderful thing of the, all the th- things that people put their creative energy into and their time into uh, there are so few things that you can just really hold up and say, yes, this is a thing that's actually making the world a better place in a way that is just so human that everyone can relate to Uh, mental illness, happy hour with Paul. And uh, I hope you can do it for hundreds and hundreds of more episodes. Thanks Kirk. That means a lot to me. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. And please, please take care of yourself. Uh, Paul, why should people try to take care of themselves? Um, They shouldn't, Kirk. They should try to burn their their lives to the ground because (laughs) it's entertaining for the rest of us. And then we feel better about ourselves. Was that a bad note to end the the podcast on? (laughs) No, it's perfect. It's perfect. (laughs) 